My name is Sarah McArdle of the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. I'm, I just wanted to show you a demonstration of using QPath to do a full analysis of um, a sample. There's lots of resources online for how to use QPath to do any individual stage of an analysis, how to detect cells, how to measure area, how to run a PITS classifier. Um, and if you are, need help with any of those things, I recommend either going to the QPath Read the Docs site or Michael Nelson's wonderful uh, imagescientist.com site, um, or of course the uh, image, image SC forum. There's also the uh, previous, the old recordings from the New Bias seminar about a year ago, and the Lohe Institute put on a, a seminar about two years ago with recordings of how to do uh, lots of individual stages, lots of individual steps. Um, but I see a lot of questions on the image SC forum of uh, people not being quite sure how to put all of those individual parts together into a full, more complicated analysis. So I just wanted to demonstrate that here. Um, so I'm in uh, QPath 0.3.2. And the first thing I'm going to do, and the first thing you should always do um, uh, with QPath is to create a new project. Um, so there I'm just going to call this QPath demo project. Uh, I'm just going to start a new folder uh, called QPath Demo Project and drag it into um, into QPath, and it's going to ask if I want to create a project for this empty directory. Yes, I do. Uh, then for this project, I'm going to use the Luca Seven Color image. Um, this is a open source image. Um, you can find it on the uh, uh, QPath Read the Docs acknowledgments page. Uh, here, it's right here. Um, it's produced by Perkin Elmer. And um, if you go to the website, uh, you can uh, find uh, this image along with a couple of similar ones. Um, but I, I just like to use this one because it's a great uh, fluorescence image and it's open source and available for everyone to use for training. So I'm going to drag the image into the project. And I'm going to say this is a fluorescence image because I know it is. All right. Um, so this image right here, it's a section of some form of tumor. I'm actually not exactly sure what. Uh, but if we open up the brightness and contrast settings, we can see what all of the channels are. Um, let's go one by one. We've got uh, PDL1, which is a common um, immuno oncology marker, CD8 that marks uh, <laughs> CD8 T cells, FOXP3, which is also for T cells, uh, CD68 positive macrophages, PD1, um, which is the receptor for PDL1, uh, cytokeratin, which is often used as a marker for, the, uh, for tumors itself, uh, DAPI, which marks nuclei, and then autofluorescence, which just kind of shows tissue structure. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is, well, the first thing I'm going to do is create a uh, full tissue annotation, full, full shape annotation. Uh, let me turn on my input display so that right here you can see anything I'm typing or what I'm doing with my mouse. Um, to create a square, a rectangle around this entire slide, you can go to ob objects, annotations, create full image annotation. Now you get one nice rectangle there. Um, so immediately we can see that this uh, this whole image is uh, 650,000 microns. Okay. Then I'd like to find the tumors. And um, luckily there's this nice cytokeratin stain, so it's going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, so I think all I need to do for here is just to use a, a thresholder-based pixel classifier. So I'm going to go to classify, uh, pixel classification, create thresholder. And um, I'm going to use the cytokeratin channel. Uh, as I said, there's lots of resources for uh, going step by step through every, um, every input into this window. Uh, I recommend the read the docs, which explains what everything is. So I'm, I'm going to go through this relatively fast. 
Um, uh, but what I'm going to say is I want a, a pretty high resolution, let's say a 2 micron uh, resolution uh, classifier on the cytokeratin channel. And then I need to set a threshold. Um, so I'm going to go back to the grayscale cytokeratin image and then hold my mouse over some positive staining and in the bottom right corner over here it shows the, the intensity which for some positive staining is around 8, for some negative staining is around 0. Um, so let's put in a threshold of 1, see how it looks. Um, and anything above this threshold is going to be tumor. Uh, so right away you can see the results and it's picking up way too much of the background. So let's set a threshold of 2. All right. That is looking a lot better. Uh, I like to include a little bit of uh, Gaussian smoothing. Um, it just makes, uh, it, it removes some of this like junky stuff over here without having to lose sensitivity. All right, overall that looks pretty good. Create objects, all annotations, exactly the same. I do want to create objects for the ignored class because my, uh, my non-tumor non region is going to be this region star, and this star means it's going to be ignored unless otherwise specified, and I, I, I want to create that annotation. Okay, so now we have uh, one set of shapes over the uh, tumor and another set of shapes over the um, non-tumor region. Uh, this can be a little confusing because the outlines actually completely overlap. Um, if you press uh, Shift F, it will fill in. Um, so now you can see the the everything that's colored slightly red is the tumor, and everything in the background is just region. Okay. Um, so I'm just checking out the quality of. That annotation. Overall, I'm happy with it. It's finding, it's finding um, the tumor spots. It's ignoring some junk that I don't want to count. It does leave like this weird hole where that's kind of like in the middle of the tumor. Uh, I think that's right. I'm not a pathologist, uh, so hopefully biologically that that's accurate. And if not, I'm sorry about that. Um, so now I'm going to turn on. Uh, I'm going to turn on the nuclei. I'm going to uh, hide the. Um, I'm going to unfill the annotations by hitting Shift F again, so that we can just see the nuclei. Uh, and one thing we can notice right away is that the nuclei inside the tumor are just look very different than the ones outside the tumor. These are very large. Um, and very dense, and these are all, the ones out here are just a lot smaller, um, and that some of them have some weird shapes. So like this isn't like kind of a classical looking nuclei where it's filled in in the center, and then some of these are just kind of open circles. Um, uh, so if we want to count cells, we're going to have to use uh, slightly different parameters inside the inside the cytokeratin region and outside. So first, uh, let's first do outside. Um, so for that I'm going to uh, click on the region annotation and go to analyze cell detection, detect cells. Um, I'm going to set the pixel size to be whatever it is in this image. Oh look, it's the same. I'm going to just type out. 0.498, but I don't believe that actually makes a difference. For the moment, let's just leave it all the defaults as is. Hit run. See what happens. Um, nothing happens. And that's okay. And the problem is this threshold. Um, once again, if we look at the intensity of the, the uh, signal at, at the bottom right corner over here, a uh, nuclei has an intensity of around 10, 
7. Uh, the background has an intensity of around 0.5. Um, so an intensity of thresh uh, a threshold of 100 is far too high. Um, let's set that to 5. Uh, I'm not super not thrilled with it, but OK. Uh, as I said, there's lots of resources already out there for how to optimize these parameters. Um, and as always, when you're dealing with a large, uh, a large piece of tissue, you're not going to find um, one parameter that is just perfect and gets every cell 100% accurate. It just doesn't happen. Uh, biology just refuses to cooperate. So you uh, do the best you can um, and make uh, compromises that make sense. Try to balance uh, splitting too many cells with uh, merging too many cells. Um, but I think I think this looks pretty good overall. It's getting most of the cells most of the time. Cool. Um, so I'm actually now, uh, just so I don't get confused, going to delete these cells. Uh, but don't worry, the, um, in the workflow window, it is paying attention to everything we're doing. So it has a recording of all of the different cell detection uh, parameters we tried. Um, and so the last one is the, the one we were happiest with. Um, now I'm going to click on the tumor region. And I'm actually going to, instead of just clicking on it in the annotation list, I'm going to right click on tumor and say select objects by classification. Uh, it, it, it ends with the exact same results, but now in the workflow tab, it shows that we clicked, that we uh, selected the tumor. Okay. And let's just uh, go back to starting with the default parameters. Here, and these were the parameters I decided on tumor region. Cool. So now we have lots of cells. Um, overall, if we click on the full region annotation, we can see that there's 5,503 total cells. Great. Um, the next stage uh, of the project is going to be classifying. Uh, the cells, um, at, um, especially the ones outside the tumor. Uh, let me bring this back up. Um, so what we have here are uh, CD8 T cells, uh, some regulatory cells. So the, uh, this panel is clearly looking at the immune response. Here's um, some uh, the, the macrophages, and then PD1 and PDL1, um, which together define a, a, um, a really common, a commonly studied uh, immuno oncology pathway. Okay. Um, so the first thing I like to do when whenever measuring cells um, is just uh, whenever classifying cells is just. Uh, throw in a couple of extra measurements. We might need them, we might not, but I like to just get them done at the beginning. So for that, I'm going to go to select all cells. And so they, they all turn yellow really fast. Uh, um, and go to calculate features, add intensity features. Um, as soon as the cells are created, uh, uh, QPath automatically measures a, a lot their mean and standard deviation and min-max intensity in all the channels, as well as some shape parameters uh, like nucleus area and I think cell area? No, not cell area. Oh yeah, here. Um, but uh, I also like to include the Haralict features. Uh, these are a measure of texture. It, it's hard to describe um, exactly what these things are measuring. There's a set of 12 of them. But in general, if It'll, um, you could have two cells with the same average intensity, one which has just a smooth amount of signal um, everywhere in the cytoplasm and one which has really spotted, um, like, a, uh, like a vesicle pattern. And these hieroglyph features will uh, tell you, uh, will show you that difference. 
So for all of the interesting channels, which are all of those five, I'm going to uh, compute parallel features. Um, I'm going to do it at the, the real pixel size. And, and then you need to um, put it in your intensity values. Uh, the minimum is definitely zero. And then let's turn on all of these and just look at what like the largest numbers I'm seeing. Again, I'm just looking at the bottom right corner. Um, I saw something go up to 20. Uh, looking at bright regions. Oh, oh. Uh, CD8 can get really bright. What is that now? PD1 can get very bright. Okay. Um, the largest number I saw was 30, so let's put in a max of 30. And I have somewhere along the way I unselected my detections, so I'm going to go back and select my cells and hit run. Um, and I, once again, I want to process all cells. Um, that step in particular might be slow if your computer has limited RAM. Um, I also like to uh, include smoothed features. So for this, I'm going to select the entire, uh, the entire slide and go to Analyze, uh, Calculate Features, Add Smoothed Features, and let's say uh, radius of 100, uh, radius of 50, diameter of 100. Um, that choice is a little arbitrary. Just what I'm trying to get at is like everything in this region over here is just brighter than everything in this region. So I, I might want to change my thresholds a little bit depending on the, the local intensity. Nothing pops up when you do that. Um, it just runs and then it, it stops. And then if we turn on detections and go to our measurement maps, um, I'm going to fill in detections. We can now see um, every measurement for every cell in this very nice graphical way. Uh, for instance, uh, here's CD8, CD68 mean, uh, DAPI mean might, in the nucleus might be well, meaningful. Um, PDL1, so you can see that bright region that we were looking at before is all bright. Um, uh, the smoothed regions, like the smoothed, uh, smoothed cell average. Um, so that uh, this is what it shows you is it just kind of well smooths out your signal so that you can see in general everything up here is has just more PDL1 than everything over here. Um, um, and let me show you some of the um, Herlicht features. Um, these don't really, it's hard to describe exactly what these are doing, but they're just pulling out different aspects of the tissue and the different channels. Uh, okay, uh, so now we have cells, we have measurements, we have some annotations. Um, now it is time to actually set up a classifier. Okay, I'm going to once again turn off the annotations um, and I'm going to uh, just look at the grayscale. Um, let's start with CD8. I'm starting with CD8 because it's one of the easier ones. You could just, it just um, pops up right away. Here's a T cell, here's a T cell, here's a T cell. Um, so because it's so clean and so easy, I can just define my T-cells um, based on a, um, a, a single measurement, um, which is just going to be mean intensity. So I'm going to go to classify, object classification, create single measurement classifier. Um, I'm looking at CD8. And... Uh, it gives you the option of whether you want to look in the nucleus, in the cytoplasm, which is the ring outside the nucleus, or the whole cell, which is everything. 
Um, and while biologically speaking, CDH should just be on the cell membrane and shouldn't be in the nucleus, it's pretty common for it to, in a, in a tissue slice, you'll see it um, kind of going everywhere. So maybe the full cell, no, actually. Um, yeah, I think cytoplasm's right. And I think maybe we should have used a smaller radius, but that's okay. So I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna look at the mean intensity of CD8 in the cytoplasm. Um, and I'm going to say everything above, uh, right now it's 0.2, but we'll change this. Everything with a mean intensity of above 0.2 will be, uh, will be CD8. Oh, but first we have to set up the classes. Uh, so in the annotations tab, I'm going to right click, populate from image channels. And I do want to keep available classes. Um, so now it gives me all of these options. Uh, and over here I can say CD8. Hit live preview, and okay. Right now, everything that is yellow is uh, is being classified as CDA. Um, one thing I like to do is change how this is viewed, uh, which is uh, right now it's showing a cell boundary and a nucleus boundary. I'm going to go to uh, cell boundaries only, and it just gets rid of that, and it's just a little cleaner to look at. Okay. Um, and you can always fill in or not. Um, so this is weird. It looks like cells are overlapping, but it's because there's a, um, uh, a, a uh, tumor right here. And since we defined the cells into separate steps, they can overlap right at this boundary. Um, uh, so it's defining uh, cells like this as CD8 positive, even the because there's just the tiniest bit of CD8 signal here, that that shouldn't count. Um, that that shouldn't be counted as a CD8 cell. So I'm going to double. Okay. Um, and I'm I'm going to on purpose leave the below threshold blank. See, so we have saved our CD8 classifier. Um, and next, we're going to move on to the next easiest channel, which is FOXP3. So let's turn off CD8 and turn on FOXP3. Um, uh, FOXP3 is supposed to be a nuclear signal, so we're only going to look in the nuclear compartment. And in fact, I can just uh, change the way I view this to just be in the nucleus, to just show the nuclear outlines. Save that, um, and uh, exact same process for uh, PD-1. Um, for PD-1, I'm going to use the full, no, just the cytoplasm again. The, the signal appears to just be in the cytoplasm. No, uh, I'll, I'll use the full cell. Um, basically, there is some signal in the nucleus, it's not right, but there's some, so let's use the full cell. So, oh. so P1. Um, in addition to typing, you could just scroll here. Okay, uh, I'm going to do this one fast because you don't need to watch me evaluate a threshold, an arbitrary threshold in my head, but let's call it here. In general, if you see a shape like this where there's where it goes down and then there's a little bump and then it goes um, down again, that means there's two distributions overlapping and right in the middle there is usually the correct threshold. Okay. Um, so we've made three classifiers. Uh, the next two are going to be a little harder because uh, CD68 um, has a, has an odd pattern. It's not like it's just covering the cytoplasm. A lot of the times, it's it's in it's just in like one half of the cell. Um, it's just in like 
a piece of the cell, um, and then uh, macrophages themselves have really weird shapes, and they're these elongated cells that make contact with all of their neighbors. So it's really common for neighboring cells to pick up little bits of CD8, but that doesn't mean they're truly macrophages. Um, so instead of doing a simple class classifier, I'm, I'm going to do a more complicated classifier. Um, to help set that up, I'm going to first save this file and then go to uh, Create Duplicate Channel Training Images. And I'm going to say we have we need one for CD68, and we'll need one for PDL1. We haven't gotten there yet. And now, in the project, there's the main image we're working on, and then a, a image labeled PD8, PDL1 and an image labeled CD68. These are just labels. It doesn't actually change anything. Um, all of the channels still exist, but it's just to help you keep track of what's what you're doing. Um, so when I click on, when I double click on the PDL1 image, since I saved the data ahead of time, all of the cells still exist, all of the annotations are still there, um, and all of the cell measurements have been copied over. But now I'm just kind of starting on a brand new, fresh image. Um, so I'm going to PDL1. Sorry, I wanted to start on CD68. Um, so now, to find the macrophages, I'm going to uh, train a object classifier. Um, and I like to do that uh, with the points annotation tool. Um, I'm, I'm, gonna close this. I'm using that because these macrophages, they're kind of scattered throughout the tissue. It's not like there's one region with tons of macrophages and um, one region with none. Uh, so you just open up this tool, go to Add, um, and set set the first um, set of points to be the CD68 class. And then just click on a bunch of CD68 cells. That's a macrophage, that's a macrophage. Do it all throughout the tissue. That's a macrophage, that's a macrophage, that's a macrophage. Click on a whole bunch. Um, as always, macrophages themselves are complicated. Like I think this CD68 blob is associated with this cell, but I'm not I'm not 100% certain. But that's what I'm going to tell Keypad that's happening. Um, wherever you put a dot, it's it's going to find the center of the dot, and then know that whatever cell that center of that dot is, uh, whatever cell that's on. Um, it is a macrophage. Um, now I'm going to add a second class, call it the ignore class, and then click on a bunch of things that aren't macrophages. Uh, I like to start with the really easy ones, so tumor cells are not macrophages, and you don't even have to be careful about where you're putting them. None of these things are macrophages. And then uh, and, th and then go to some more complicated examples. Like for instance, this cell, um, it picked up, the, the cell boundary picked up a little bit of the tail of this macrophage, but this cell, this cell's not a macrophage. Um, that's not a macrophage. Whew. Stuff like this is hard because sometimes I just don't know. Macrophages are complicated. So now we've got a bunch of points to start with, um, and we're going to go to Classify, Object Classification, Train Object Classifier. It's going to start with all measurements. Um, and I'm, for the moment, I'm just going to hit Live Update and see what happens. Uh, so the pink cells are what it's labeling as CD68. Uh, the red cells are being ignored. Uh, one trick I like to do is uh, to go to hide all of the unclassified cells, and that is click on none, right click, uh, show hide. Uh, you can also do the same thing with spacebar. So now non-macrophages are just ignored. 
and um, the CD68 positive cells are bright pink. Uh, so then from here you just find mistakes and fix them. So that's a macrophage. And as long as a live update is on, it will just keep iterating. Uh, that's macrophage. That one, I'm not sure. Not sure. Uh, th yeah. These are not. Okay. Um, ooh, that's not, that's not. Uh, I want to spend a minute to talk about measurements. Um, right now it's using all of the measurements we've made for every cell. Uh, but I think that's actually not uh, great. I don't want it to be using the information from CD8 to decide if something CD68 positive that will affect whether or not things are truly double positive and things like that. So I'm going to hit selected measurements. Um, and uh, I'm going to CD68. I want it to use all of the CD68 measurements. So that's all of the intensities, all of the hair-like features, and all of the smoothed features. Um, I also want it to use the shape features because they're there, so we might as well use them, um, which is nucleus area and eccentricity, and then scroll down, I'm looking for cell area. Cell area perimeter. Um, but now it's ignoring all the other channels, all the DOPI, the autofluorescence, the CD8s, all of them, and hit apply. Again, not perfect. Um, if I were doing this for a real project, I'd probably spend an hour um, going through in detail all of the results, and if you have more than one um, more than one slide, you have to train on it. every slide or at least a representative batch of slides. If you have 50 slides, you can just pick five or so, but it's really important that you not train a classifier just on one example and then expect it to be expected to correctly extrapolate to all of your examples. Even if you think that they're from the same batch, everything will be exactly the same. They never are. There's always some slide to slide difference. and um, you want to catch that really early and not find out at the end of your analysis that your classifier was never right. Um, okay, but for the purposes of this demo, I think that looks pretty good. So that's going to be the CD68. Now I can close that. And uh, one of the benefits of using these uh, training images is now I can move on to a different image and all of the annotations I've made for this training are completely saved. So I don't have to delete them or anything and if later I decide I'm actually not happy with my classifier, I can go back to this image and start where I was and um, keep what I've done already and just build on to it and not have to start over. Um, okay, so now I'm go I've moved to the PDL1 image. Uh, so this PDL1 signal is really, it's really hard to deal with. Um, there's some places where you can clearly identify that this cell is PDL1 positive, it's clear, but then there's just a lot of places where I don't know which cell e each of this signal belongs to. It says like network, and while I can say in general, this region has a lot of PDL1 and probably almost all of the cells are positive. Um, I can't say for sure that it's every cell or most of them. I'm just I'm just unsure. So instead of trying to um, trying to identify cells as positive or negative and being unhappy with the results, it, um, I'm going to just uh, analyze the PDL1 in a slightly different way. Um, I'm just going to make a a pixel classifier that just finds the total amount of PDL1. We won't know for sure that it's this cell or that cell, we'll just know how much PDL1 is in this sample. And then if we had a different sample, we could do the same thing and then compare um, just like 
area fractions or things like that. Uh, so once again, in the PDL1 training image, um, I'm going to start to, to train a uh, pixel classifier. And that, that process looks pretty similar to training the object classifier. You, uh, I'm going to just make some annotations, call them uh, positive or negative, and uh, let QPath do the work of finding the pattern and training the classifier. Uh, so click on the PDL1 class. I like to have auto set on, that way I don't have to uh, click on set class every time. And I'm going to use this um, polyline tool and say all of these pixels, these pixels that I'm highlighting right here, these are PDL1 positive. Uh, v, v just brings back the tool, these are PD1 positive. Start with a couple of the easy examples of things that I'm sure of. Um, then all of these things are negative. All of these pixels are negative. Are positive uh, here. Right. Then you start getting into the more difficult regions of. I'm not sure if that's a if that's positive or not. Um, once again, please have a negative control that makes decisions like this easier. It looks to me like this kind of blobby region is not uh, is not positive. Um, again, I'm not a pathologist. Please don't use this to to decide what's. <laughs> please don't take any PDL one knowledge from this. Um, I just want to show an example of um, uh, the, this region here that has a kind of different texture. I'm gonna say even though it's red, it it doesn't really count as true PDL one. So I selected the ignore class and uh, I marked that uh, ignore. Um, to get rid of these lines, I'm just going to hide the tumor and the region. And now we can just see the classifications. Uh, okay, let's see how it's doing. Analyze, uh, train, cl uh, classify, pixel classification, train pixel classifier. Um, so now we've got most of our cell class, we've got all of our cell classifiers done individually. We've got um, a PDL1 classifier done. Um, let's put it all together. So I'm going to go back to the original, uh, original image that we were looking at. Um, turn off this classifier. Turn on the cells. We've got lots and lots of cells here. Um, so, okay, I'm going to uh, turn all of those individual cell classifiers into a um, one single composite classifier. And to do that, go to classify, object classification, create composite classifier. Uh, so here's the four individual ones we made. Um, the order that you select things is important. So I'm going to say, I want to know first if it's a T a CD8 cell, then if it's FOXP3, then if it's CD68, then if it's PDL1, and call this composite 1, give it a fly. Ah, look at that. Um, so now we have lots of different colors showing lots of different cell types. This cell is a pure macrophage, this cell is a pure CD, it's FOXP3. This one is, this one's confusing because it's saying it's FOXP3 positive, CD68 positive, PD1 positive. Um, let's see what that looks like. Is it, it is FOXP3 positive. It might be CD68. No, I, I think that's a mistake in the classifier. I think it's not. Um, and, but I do think it's CD, PD1 positive. Um, the more uh, classifiers you add to your composite classifier, the more mistakes you will find because these errors tend to, to compound. Um, so that's unfortunate that I selected 
first, thing, first one I tested was a mistake, but okay. Here's a bunch of cells. Um, so then uh, we, we also know, sorry, while, while we're here, because of the object hierarchy, we have the object hierarchy, scrolling all the way to the top. We know that the region annotation has a total of uh, 3,973 cells, of which 312 are macrophage and all of these different combinations. And we know that separately for the tumor annotations, um, there's only 1,500 cells, of which 27 are macrophage. Some, so you can immediately start calculating cell frequency um, just from these numbers. Um, cool. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is select the uh, tumor region and the uh, <laughs> the tumor and the, the non-tumor regions. Once again, select objects by classification, and then actually run the PDL1 pixel classifier that we uh, created before. Load pixel classifier, uh, PDL1. It is important that I select both of the the tumor and the region. Um, annotations uh, as, as two separate annotations and not just the full rectangle because I I want to know where in the um, where in the hierarchy that the PDL one is found that was a crazy sentence anyway I'm going to um, create objects from this PDL one classifier uh, the current selection which is the tumor and the region annotations and um, I do want these to be annotations, but I want the minimum object uh, size to be a lot smaller. Let's say two microns. If, it, if anything's smaller than two square microns, we're just going to ignore it. Um, okay. So now within what we've called the tumor region, we've got uh, some PDL1 signal and within the, the other region. We've got PDL1 signal. Okay, now there is a lot going on on this uh, slide. Uh, I'm going to hide all the negative cells just to make it a little easier, but there's just there's just a lot going on. Um, but that's okay, even if you're confused, QPath has kept track of everything. Speaking of which, let's save. Just for fun. Uh, last step is measuring distance. We want to know um, how far this macrophage is from a tumor, how far is it from a PDL1 blob. Um, so what we're going to do is go to objects, select all cells, uh, and then go to analyze, calculate features, then spatial analysis. Distance to annotations 2D. Um, we don't have any more multi part classifications, so this isn't going to matter. And once again, it doesn't pop up anything, it just, uh, it's just done. Now, if we go to the measurement maps, within the R detections, we have. Yes, that's correct. Um, we have some new measurements called why doesn't does that not say ah. Ah. there we go um, so now it's showing you the distance to the nearest tumor annotation and the distance to the nearest PDL1 annotation um, Anything that's within within a tumor or within the PDL one uh, shows up as black, um, and we have that for every cell. So this FOXP three cell is 
52 microns from the nearest tumor, which is probably this blob, or maybe that blob. Hard to say. And uh, 2.3 microns from the nearest PDL1 uh, blob, which is um, this one. So it measures the center of the cell to the edge of the annotation. Um, so what I would do when I'm looking at this data is say anything that's uh, say less than any cell that's less than five microns from a PDL1 annotation probably has at least some PDL1 in it, or at least could have been set, could maybe be a PDL1 positive cell. Right. Um, so that's Close that about it. We have cell classifications, we have pixel classifiers, we have um, large annotations, we have distance measurements, we have lots and lots of measurements. They're all listed under detection measurements. Um, so you can copy this, um, this giant table uh, to a spreadsheet and go do statistics. Um, the last thing I want to show you is how to use the workflow tab to actually generate, um, uh, generate a script to run this for a big batch of images. Uh, so it's been keeping track of nearly everything we've done. It doesn't, uh, the workflow tab doesn't record uh, every time you draw an annotation because that, that's not something that's meaningful from one slide to the next. But basically any command we gave it um, in the uh, in the menus is written down here. It can get a little confusing to read, I know that, um, because for instance it shows that we just did cell detection over and over and over and over again, um, which is true, we did that, but we don't need to repeat the first seven failed attempts at cell detection, we just need the last one. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is just hit create script, and everything that's written here is now written as a script, and uh, the, the scripting language is Groovy, which is a derivative of Java. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, scripting, I know this can be a little, um, a little intimidating, uh, but I promise it's just one for one. Everything written here has, has uh, a, a, um, a line here. So the first thing we do is set image type, and the command is set image type. When we were detecting cells, the command is one plugin cell detection. Um, and so this is just a recording of everything. Um, so step by step, uh, what we did, minimizing all of the trial and error, is um, we told it it was a fluorescence image. We created a select all object, which is the rectangle around the whole slide, which is true. Uh, we, crea we created the tumor, uh, the, the cytokeratin and the region annotations. Um, here we deleted some stuff, but we don't need to do that again. Then we, uh, ah, see, we actually needed uh, the second line, the include ignored. That's important. Um, so we uh, yeah, then we created the, the tumor and the region annotations. Um, then we did the cell detection, except the cell detection was, um, the first round of cell detection was only on the region, the non-tumor region. Um, and th at that time we had, I had just clicked on the, uh, this annotation and it didn't record that. So I'm going to instead go to select objects by classification. I'm going to copy paste that here and write in, I, want, I wanted the first cell uh, detection to only be on the region annotation, the second cell detection to only be on the tumor annotation, um, deleting all of these, this is when we went back and forth a bunch, this, this is what we wanted here, uh, okay. yeah, and you can see that these have slightly different parameters, so we ended up with an, a background of eight um, in the tumor, a background of zero outside the tumor. I think we also had different smoothing parameters. Okay. Um, so now we've got cells in the region, in the tumor. We're going to select the cells, um, run the different uh, um, 
intensity features measurements. We're going to measure intensity features. We're going to measure smooth features. Then we're going to run the object classifier, which was just called composite one. Then within the two larger annotations, um, create uh, the, the PDL one annotation, and then run distance annotations. Okay, let's see if this works. Uh, to test it, I'm just going to right click, go to duplicate image, um, and call this one. Uh, I do not want to duplicate data files. I want to start with a fresh copy of this image. Uh, yes, save this. So now, same image, same channels, um, but no annotations, no cells, no anything. Uh, so let's hit run and see what happens. Seems okay. Uh, I I actually don't know what this warning means, but the cell the the cell uh, everything ran. There's no errors. It would say in red text error no, and it would fail if something like really bad happened. Um, and we have. We have the results. We have cells with different classifications. Um, we have our uh, PDL1 annotation, which can be hard to click on. Uh, there. We have our PDL1 um, annotation. We have our tumors. We have our, our regions. And we have, uh, let me just double click on a cell. And we have all the distances right way at the bottom here. Uh, and I just realized I think there's a picture of me at the bottom left corner of the screen and you probably can't see what I'm pointing at. Okay, well, it shows distances. Um, so then I'm going to save this and go to measure, export measurements. Um, I'm just going to do this script test image, even where I could have just done the first one because they're exactly the same. Um, though if you had a whole batch, you could just run the script for the whole batch and then export everything all at once. Detections. Uh, I'm in America, so I'm using a CSV, apparently tab separated uh, value spreadsheets are more common elsewhere. Um, so output and export. Only 5,000 cells, this should be pretty fast. Or not. There we go. Project, open project, solid approach. And here is all of the cell measurements, everything we measured there. Uh, what you'd be really interested in is uh, the class of every cell, which is listed here, and the distances um, to PDL1 and to tumor. Uh, one other thing I'd like to export is the uh, um, annotation measurements. Uh, annotations, comma. That was much faster. Okay. Um, So here we've got the tumor annotation, and um, its area is 20, uh, 220,000 microns squared. Um, we've got the, the non-tumor region, which is 429,000 microns squared. Um, but then we've actually got two entries for the PDL1. Um, one one PDL1 entry has a parent of region. Um, so this is the PDL1 inside the non-tumor region. And then uh, the second PDL1 entry has a parent of tumor. So this is obviously the PDL1 inside what we were, what we annotated as tumor. So if you want an area fraction, um, you want to do this divided by this. 
times 100. Um, so 2%, 2.4% of the uh, tumor is PD-1. Um, and 4%, uh, 4.5% 4 of the, the, the other tissue is PD-1. Um, or you can say, what up here? I'm going to add up the two PD-01 regions overall, both PD-01 divided by the full slide annotation. It's here. That's 100, it should be about 3%. Yep. In total, about 3.8% uh, of the whole image was PD-01. Um, okay. Uh, like you said, this, please don't take any actual knowledge about pd one or immune oncology from this video. I'm <laughs> clearly not an expert in that. I just wanted to show you how you would put together uh, a more complicated project with a bunch of different steps, um, how to get that into a script and how to use the hierarchy to understand where your, um, uh, where your cells are and uh, what all of these numbers mean. Um, please let me know if you have any questions about anything. I'm always available. I, I respond to questions on the image forum pretty fast, or you can email me or anything like that. Thank you.